All right, so let's go through the processor control and data path practice problems. So for the first one, you're gonna go ahead and do your review. So you're gonna write down your answers on your own and then discuss them in your group. So here are two questions. What does the ALU and the data path do? And how does the data path deal with the same instruction being used for different things? So go ahead, pause the video, answer the questions first on your own, then discuss them with your partner. Okay, so what does the ALU and the data path do? Here's our ALU, and you can see the outputs are going to a bunch of different places here. So let's take a look at all the different outputs. So the first output here goes around past the memory through the memory to register MUX and back into the register file. So the ALU is gonna send results to the register file. So this is for add instructions. So this is calculating results for the register file. Second thing it does, it sends it directly into the memory. It sends it into the memory address. So this is for calculating the address for memory operations, such as reads and writes. And the third output here is the zero. And the zero here is used for the if branch. So this is for calculating conditional branches. So these are the three things that the ALU does in our data path. Okay, second question. How does the data path deal with the same instruction bits being used for choosing a register and encoding the immediate value? So if we take a look at the, register, the instruction encoding formats for R and I here, we can see that the same bits in both ones are used either for encoding a register file or for encoding an immediate. And how do we tell between two of these? Well, we have the control logic. And the control logic looks at the opcode. And based on the opcode, it figures out what it should do with those. So if it's an I format instruction, we're gonna ignore this third register. We're not gonna do anything with it. We're gonna use this immediate instead. And if it's an R format, we don't use this as an immediate. We just use the R third register. <clears throat> now, you should keep in mind that either way, these bits still move around. So even if I'm not using an I format instruction, bits are still going into the sign extender and they're still being sent through here, but the control logic is turning off the parts of the data path that would use them. Okay, so here's a pure instruction problem. So take a look at this data path and figure out which branches and jumps it supports. So pause the video, answer the questions on your own first, and then discuss them with your partner. Okay, so let's take a look at this. Which paths are there for figuring out next PC? Because remember, all of these things are gonna change the next PC. So in this data path here, here's where our next PC is coming from. It's coming from the round over here and going into the PC. And we've got one path here, which is PC plus four. And so this is just no branch. This is PC plus four. What other paths do we have? Well, we have another path here. And if you look at this path, this path is taking data from the instruction. It's sign extending it. It's shifting it. It's adding it into the next PC. So this is taking an immediate and shifting it over. Okay, so which of these can we eliminate from the list here? Because these are the only paths we have for this. Well, we can eliminate jump, jump and link and jump register. So jump needs a long constant. We don't have a long constant going into the next instruction. Jump and link has to write the results into the register file and jump register has to take the results from the register file. So we can't support those ones. Okay, so now the question is, what is this logic doing? Is this logic here supporting branch equal or branch not equal? So if we look at the logic here, what this logic is doing is it's taking zero and it's anding it with a branch. So this is zero and branch. So it's saying we're gonna take this path when zero is true and it's a branch. So if zero is true, when we do a subtraction or ALU, that means the two are equal. So this is branch equal. All right, now we're gonna practice adding unconditional jumps to this here. So the first part, go through this data path and figure out what do you need in terms of wires or logic or signals and where are you gonna get it from so that you can add an unconditional jump to the data path. So to understand that better, here we can take a look at how unconditional jumps look. So unconditional jumps take the current PC, they add four, but then they replace the lower 28 bits of the PC with a 26 bit immediate, which comes from the instruction itself. All right, so pause the video, answer the question together with your partner. Okay, so what do we need and where does it come from? So we need the address for the jump. Remember the address is gonna come from those 26 bits. So we need the control signal to tell us to jump. So we need something that's gonna decode the instruction and tell us it's time to jump. We're gonna need a MUX to select the jump address. Right now we only have two addresses we can select, so we're gonna need another MUX. So where do these things come from? Well, the address is gonna come from the instruction. Remember we got those 26 bits in the instruction. The control signal is gonna come from the control logic. Okay, next part. Go ahead, update your data path here to support this. Where are you gonna add wires, logic, and control logic? So go ahead, pause the video, answer the question together with your partner. 
Okay, let's go ahead and put this together. So here's our instruction. We want to support it. So we need to add a wire from the instruction bit. So here's our instruction. We need a wire which is going to take out those 26 bits, send it up to here. We need to shift it left. Remember, we shift this over. And then we're going to need another MUX. So this MUX is going to allow us to select which instruction, which branch type we want. We need some control logic. So we need a signal coming out of the control which tells us when we should select that. And this control logic is going to assert that's true if the opcode is J. So for J instructions, it's going to assert jump. J is going to, jump is going to be true. This MUX is going to select this input here, which is going to take the instruction long target address, this one down here, shift it over by two, and merge it with the top bits from PC plus four. Okay, let's take a look at another one of these. So go ahead and explain the logic that controls the ALU result MUX for next PC. Okay, go ahead, pause the video, answer the question together with your partner. Okay, now we wanna control this next logic here. So we've got our ALU, and what is our ALU gonna do? Well, the ALU is gonna do subtraction. So we're gonna take two registers and we're gonna subtract them, and if they're zero, that means they're equal. So we've got zero coming out here. Now, what's the logic in the MUX to do this? Well, we need to support two different conditions. So if we have a zero is true and we're branch equal, that means they are equal and we wanna do a branch equal, then we wanna go ahead and jump. But there's another condition. If it's not zero, that means if the two registers are not equal, but we have a branch not equal. So if this is true, that means we have branch not equal and they're not equal, so we want to branch. And this is true, if we have branch equal and they are equal, we want to branch. So this logic needs to do those two things. Now, what signals do we need from control here? So we need outputs for both of those. So we need two outputs. We need output telling us if it's branch not equal or branch equal. So we're going to have to have two outputs from that, and then we'll have this logic in our MUX to select which one to do. Okay, here's a pure instruction question. So go ahead, pause the video, answer it first on your own, and then discuss it with your partner. Okay, so which ones of these can we eliminate? So does jump and link need a constant? So think about what jump and link is gonna do. It's gonna to go to an address and it's gonna it's going to then store the next PC so you can come back to it. Yes, it does need an address. So it can't be an R format. So we can cross out all the ones that had jump and link as an R format. All right, let's take a look at the two of these here. Does jump register need a constant? Well, no, jump register just takes the register and puts it in there. So what does it need? Well, it needs a register file. So it can't be J format because J format doesn't support any register files. So it can't be that one. So that means we have this format for those two instructions. Okay, next problem. Now we're gonna work on adding jump and link and jump register to the data path. So what do you need to add for jump and link and jump register and where are you gonna get the stuff you need to add? To help you out, here's some descriptions of these instructions. Here are the details of how they work. You can see that jump and link this is gonna take a J type instruction. So it has a large immediate in here and it's gonna hard code. It's gonna write into register 31. It's gonna write PC plus four into register 31. Jump register down here. What format instruction is this? Well, it needs to have a register. So this is an R format. It doesn't use the other registers, but it uses one of them. Okay, so pause the video, answer the question together with your partner. All right, let's take a look at this. Jump and link and jump register. So for jump and link, we need to take the next PC, we need to get it to the register file. We need to get the immediate from the instruction to where we're gonna to jump to and get it to next PC. And we need a MUX for controlling the register file and the control. For jump register, we need to get the value from the register file to the next PC. And we need control logic to do that. So we're gonna get these things. Well, jump and link gets the next PC from the instruction immediate and jump register gets the next PC from the register file. So in case you haven't guessed, now we're gonna do part two, go ahead and change the data path to support these. So what do you need to add to your data path to support these two instructions? Pause the video, answer the question together with your partner. All right, so let's take a look at what we need to change for this. So for jump and link, we need to add a wire and that wire is gonna collect, connect PC plus four into the right port of the register file because we need to take the next instruction and put it into the register file. Remember, jump and link stores the next PC so we can come back to it when we do procedure calls. Then we need to add a MUX in here so we can control our regular write signal versus this signal. 
and we need to have some sort of control logic which tells us which one to do. Now there's one other thing we need. It always writes into register 31. So we need to have another 31 as our write register here, and we need to have a control signal to make sure that we can select that when we need it. All right, so that's what we need for jump and link. Let's take a look at jump register. So jump register means we're gonna to need to take data out of the register file and get it in as our next PC. So we're gonna to have to take that out. We're gonna need another mux up here so we can select that value if we're jumping that way. And we're gonna need a control signal to tell us when we should select that value. All right, let's do a peer instruction question here. So go ahead, pause the video, answer the question first on your own. And when you both have answers, discuss it with your partner. All right, so let's go through this problem. Do we need to include the sign extend logic when calculating the critical path for a processor? All right, we've got yes and no is the obvious answers. Then we've got two in the middle, which are sort of conditional. So the first one here, only if programs use iFormat instructions. Well, iFormat instructions, those are the ones that do sign extension. So do we need to use it here? Well, yeah, obviously if we have an iFormat instruction, it's gonna go through the sign extender. So if we don't have that in the critical path, we're gonna to go too fast and we won't get the result. So these instructions will actually be wrong if we don't include that. But what about programs that do not use the iFormat instruction? Do we have to count it for those? Well, if you never use iFormat instructions, why have a sign extender at all? So there, are, there may be programs that don't use iFormat instructions, but if you set up your critical path to work on those programs, then any program that did use an iFormat instruction would crash. It wouldn't work reliably because you would have too short a critical, sorry, you'd have too high a clock speed, you wouldn't get the results out of that. So you need to set your clock speed for what the longest critical path that any program could use, even if not all programs are using those instructions. So the answer is yes, you need to include it. All right, let's do some practice for the critical path here. So go through and calculate the time to execute the following instructions. So we've got these instructions and then we've got all these times here. So pause the video, answer the question together with your partner. All right, so let's take a look at the first path, add i. So where does add i go? Well, add i is gonna go through the register instruction memory. It's gonna read from the register file, go through the ALU, go back around and write back into the register file. So we add up all those, we get 10 plus five plus 20 plus five, 40 nanoseconds. Sorry, it's a typo up there. Now that's one of the paths. We also have the immediate. So what's the immediate do? Well, the immediate has to go through here. It has to go through the instruction, go to the sign extender and get to the adder and go all the way around. So that's 45 nanoseconds. So when you look at this instruction, it's the longer of the two paths. So it is 45 nanoseconds, my mistake. So we have to take the longer of the two paths, so it's 45 nanoseconds. All right, let's take a look at add. Well, add's gonna be simpler. It only has one path. And as we saw before, for the register file part, it's 40 nanoseconds. How about branch equal? Well, branch equal has a bunch of things that go on here. So there's subtraction of the two register files up to the mux here, which is 35 nanoseconds. Then we have this part here where we're going through the immediate, which we're sending to the mux, which is 40 nanoseconds. And then we have the first part here, which is calculating PC plus four, which is 10 nanoseconds. So you take the longest of those paths and you get 40 nanoseconds. All right, let's take a look at load word. So load word has the longest path here. And you can see it's going through the memory here and the memory is the slowest part because it's big. So that slows us down the most. That's 145 nanoseconds. So if these are the only instructions in this processor, we can look at this and say the slowest one is gonna determine how fast the processor goes. So one over 145 nanoseconds is a whopping seven megahertz. All right, we have two extra problems here. So go ahead if you want, these are extra. Pause the video, answer the questions together with your partner, and then go, go over them. Okay, so the first problem, why is it acceptable performance-wise to be able to do two reads and one write from the register file, but the memory can only do one read or write at a time? And the answer here is all of the above. So the register file is small, and that means we can make it much more complex and an acceptable cost. Register files, tend to be really expensive in processors because they have lots of ports. Typical register file may have six or eight read ports so you can do a bunch of instructions at the same time. The memory is way too large for this design, but since register operations are most of it, you can do that and it's okay. So it's worth spending the transistors and spending the energy to make the register file flexible. All right, the second one here is what are the control signals for branch not equal? Now let's take a look at this. So for branch not equal, we're not writing to the register file. We don't write a result back, so that's zero. 
We're taking our data not from the sign extender. Remember, the ALU for branch.equal is going to compare two registers. So the ALU reg source is going to be read data to. We're doing a subtraction to see if they're equal. And now the question becomes, how do we choose the PC source? So do we jump if it's zero or not zero? Well, when it's zero, that means they're equal. But we want branch not equal. So we're going to jump if they're not equal. All right, go ahead for the reflection questions. Pause the video and answer the questions on your own. All right, now that you've answered the questions on your own, swap with your partner. Go ahead and identify, see if you can help out your partner with a better way of thinking, and then write down the feedback that your partner was able to give you. Go ahead and answer the questions together with your partner, and then you're all set. Thanks.